Scott's Pine here. And for identification purposes, your cones are very, uh, very telling. Uh, what kind of pine it is sort of type thing. So this is a Scots pine. The orange bark is the dead giveaway, but the the pine cones, if you uh, take the picture of the pine cone or take it back to your house and go online, you can identify the pine just from its cone. Most um, horticultural identification processes are buds, flowers, and reproductive organs, and that's the, that's the seed pods. So Scots pine and uh, I don't see any porcupine damage here, but uh, I do see these lines all in a, in a row. Now, if you've got just uh, sporadic lines on your tree, that's a bird going after larva, which means you've got some kind of wood boring insect in your tree. If you've got vertical and, and, and horizontal lines on your tree, that's just sap sucker so you don't have to worry about those and they're not going to cause enough damage to the tree obviously to set it back <laughs> so they'll come every year and they'll get their sugar fix out of here and the the tannins um, that are in most conifers uh, are really good for their their health and their digestion so that's typically why they do go after these particular types of tree um, the other insects that uh, typically go after Organisms that go after pine trees is, is the uh, pine needle scale. Pine needle scale in the city is really easily controlled by just the natural um, insects that are in here feeding the natural predators that are going after pine needle scale. Um, spraying them is not really of much use. This tree's never been sprayed. Uh, it's probably 50 years old and uh, it's doing just fine. It's marvelous. These are actually my favorite trees. So uh, pine needle scale control is good for, if you're out in the country, it's different because you get more insects that, uh, uh, that don't, you're not, you're not surrounded by a uh, microclimate of insects that are going to attack a, a uh, pest. Uh, there's just not enough of a pest to facilitate their, uh, their existence. So in the city, it's different. We have a whole bunch of pine trees. They all have pine needle scale. I'm really searching here to find pine needle scale on this, but I can't find any, so... Um, and that's very typical in the city. Uh, you'll get some of the mugle pines, the genetically altered ones, and I don't know what it is with genetically altered, but sometimes they miss a gene or they miss a, a genome or um, that type of thing that, that, doesn't al that allows the tree to change its chemistry to control that pest on its own, or to change its flavor or to change its pheromone release. Um, and that's about it. So but one thing that we don't, I, have, I wasn't able to find uh, a sample here of rust and what it looks like is just a clump around a branch at a node. Uh, okay, so then we're gonna move over here to what I keep going to people's houses and they think their spruce tree is dead. Now, if you look at the form of this tree, it looks like a spruce tree and it does look like it's dead because there's no green needles. This is a deciduous conifer, okay? Um, there's two types of larch. Larix is the common or the Ita Latin name, Italian name. Sorry, I'm Italian. <laughs> the Latin name is Larix, and uh, there's two species that grow in the in the mountains, and they you know different ranges in the montane and the alpine range. Um, so of course one is called the alpine larch, uh, but the larches are the ones that are deciduous. So they will shed their needles in the fall and send them back out in the spring. And you can tell if you get in close here, you can actually see them starting to flush out. And again, you know, their pH is, is, is in that uh, 6.5 to 7 point range. <clears throat> Beautiful trees and very hardy. And we very seldom get anything other than the odd sawfly that attacks them. Be close here to see, but you can see inside the color is turning on the spruce. Um, and that's for the most part natural needle drop as the season progresses like the, as you can see we just saw our first bug so when people call me right now like, I think I got a bug I think I have a disease they're not actively feeding yet they're just kind of starting to come out in a week it'll be full-on you know feeding but uh, right now it's it's usually natural needle drop the needles on most of your conifers five to seven years if you get a bristlecone pine 12 13 years 
but they typically don't don't hang on to those needles forever. That's why when you're walking through the forest, you'll see stems and green tops. Um, if they're not getting enough sunlight to feed the tree and help it with its reproduction and root growth and all that kind of stuff, they shed those needles. They don't waste them if they're not getting enough sunlight to produce food. And that's, that's just the browning inside here. You see? Come out, they got sunlight and now they're not getting it, so they're shedding those needles. And that's why when they fall down, and don't clean those up. Like, leave those down, even if it's on turf. Eventually that turf underneath the tree will disappear and uh, you'll have a healthier, happier tree because of that. Oh, it's okay. Just dehydration. Every time I see black nodes, blackening in the nodes, that's two, it's two things it could be. Rhizosphariae, which is a fungus, they need to be treated with copper fungicide. Um, copper, well not copper, it doesn't have to be copper, but it has to be treated with a fungicide. Copper-based fungicides are the most effective. Um, so if it's rhizosphery, then you want to be treating that with that. The other blackening at the nodes could be just the spruce bark aphids, which we had a terrible outbreak last year. Uh, I don't anticipate it this year because we have had lots of rain, well lots of snow and, and a little bit of rain this year already, so not as concerning. And as you can see, because they haven't been doing a lot of pruning, they don't have Cytospora canker. Uh, on a lot of city trees, that just does not seem to pop up. Uh, and it's not because the city trees are tougher or smarter or anything. It's very simply due to the fact that they're not in there constantly snipping and clipping the, the trees, the secateurs, and disinfecting their tools. Uh, now, I would assume that the city does do the disinfections, um, whereas some private companies are so busy trying to make money they just don't think about that aspect of it uh, even your chainsaws you got to clean those off too I mean anything that's cutting the wood is going to pick up particles of wood that's going to have you know bacteria or fungus or insect egg sacs or whatever in that wood and you go to the next tree and you just share it for it uh, obviously the deer the rabbits the birds you know they're all going to share those diseases as well but if you don't give them an, an open site is that is he can overtake us no. Okay, good. He's, <laughs> He's looking for a girl. I was curious who he was. Yeah, He's so right there in the larch. Yeah. Yeah. So good hiding man. spot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the other thing on, on your spruce trees that you can look for, and I'm going to talk more about the spruce trees more than anything else. The exotic trees are fine, but they don't have a lot of issues. Spruce trees tend to have a lot of issues in our area here. So we want to we want to get the internodal growth. So if you kind of follow the terminal bud back to there. So last year they really didn't put on a lot of growth. So that's about three inches. Um, the year before was about four inches. The year before that about four inches. So this is this is fairly typical. Six inches is normal. But this is typical in our region, especially in parks where they're growing and competing for nutrients with the grass and not necessarily getting fertilized, you know, on, on any regular intervals or anything. But that internodal growth is a real indicator of, of what's going on as far as your watering goes. If you're, if you're wondering if you're watering enough and fertilizing enough, uh, and I'm being very cautious about the fertilizers, you know, once every four or five years is more than enough for most of our trees in our region. But the watering, um, I use a tin can. It's a, like a uh, Libby's Beans can, or uh, I shouldn't be mentioning brand names here, we're not mm -hmm. doing a commercial, but uh, any kind of 340 milliliter can sort of thing, stick it out there, run your water system, it, when it's full, shut it off. That gets it below the, the grass uh, roots um, and allows the tree to get enough moisture that it, it seeps down into the soil profile. Then, you're, then you'll notice the internal growth is going to get longer. If it's got more water, it'll grow better and faster. And it'll produce more chemicals to control pests for you, so you don't have to hire somebody. Okay. So I've got a pine over here. R2D2, come with me. <laughs> You're going to have some editing. <laughs> oh, I got quite a bit. We're going we're to put together a blooper reel. Um, okay, so there is a. A typical pine tree shrub and this is a another one here I'm gonna just grab some needles off of it another hawthorn just just a warning for the county probably not a best not the best tree to put in your parks 
unless you want high maintenance model suckers. So on these guys, you can see how long they are. And there's a fascicle at the bottom that holds them together. And there's little holes in there. You can't really see it through the camera, but there's little holes in there. And this has got two leaves. If we go over to our other friend here, <clears throat> another larch. You're going to be an expert by the end of this. Oh yeah. <laughs> I got better, better samples than that one. That's kind of a homely looking dude. Oh, we, we hit the pit, the mother load. There we go. There's your pine needle scale. And how you can tell if they're alive or dead is by simply running your thumbnail down on them, squishing it in your hands, and you can see the little red spot. That means they're live and active. Now we can do dormant oil treatments early in the season on these to control the scale, but we can't do it after after bud break, because what happens is you end up burning the foliage. So you have to hit it with a contact at that point in time, a malathion, uh, safer soap, and then unfortunately in the city we're noticing the, they've become kind of resistant to the safer soap, so we're not using it this year. Um, and the deer seem to like it still. <clears throat> I'm looking for a pine. The pines come with, I showed you that little fascicle, with two needles coming out. So, so some of them have two needles, some of them have three needles, and some of them have five needles. No four needles unless there's a goofy branch or deer's eating one off or something, but uh, it's two, three, or five. So that's how you can break down your identification process. And the ones with two needles typically are attacked by the pine needle scale. The ones with three and five, not so much. Three, not, can be, but not as much. Five needle, I've never seen pine needle scale attack them. And the pine needle scale will transfer over to your spruce trees too. Well, there's a shining example on that spruce tree right there of what they call co-dominant stems. You look at the top of your tree and it's quite common because a crow can fly in there and break one little tiny branch and all of a sudden those two side laterals that are left will come out and start to grow up and they call it, they call it co-dominant uh, development. And of course, we don't have one to show you here, but they have two leaders um, there. And we talked about this at that shelter belt. At, uh, yep. yeah. So that spruce tree, is, the, there's the one to the south and the second one in on the far side. I know their name, but I don't want to say you don't know them, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> the, the, the two that are, that's two co-dominant stems. They always break out. When is the big, the big secret? Uh, typically, if I've got my binoculars, I can see if I see sap flow, it's going to break. That means it's torn some of that external part of the bark off and the sap is flowing, so it's going to break. And that is the result. And that one actually was, is fairly successful because they didn't, didn't lose the whole tree. Sometimes when they break out, you got your codominant stem here, and this, this one breaks out, it peels down into the bark and right down the trunk. So it makes the tree basically a hazard, so they don't want to keep it uh, because the other side's gonna blow off in the next wind. Now that tree has never, that side of that tree has never experienced the wind loads because the other side was blocking it. And that's a shining example of torquing rather than leaning. A lot of trees, you see them leaning, but that's, that's the end result of the wind. The, what actually happens is here's your, your two stems. Okay, so I'm facing west, my left hand's fast, west, facing west, and the wind's blowing and the tree is twisting like this. That's why that broke out. So it broke out and came down. The far side has never experienced wind. So that, that might not be there next year, depending on how well it adapts to its new, 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 uh, new surroundings. But that's another thing with, you know, companies coming in and thinning out the canopy um, you're, you're you're subjecting branches that have never experienced wind loads to wind loads and that's where you typically get your failures and your breakages so cleaning the out the inside I know it looks beautiful but it's the worst thing you can do for your tree number one you're probably transferring disease number two you're taking away all the little little branches and stuff like that that other birds can make nests out of so they're not gonna nest in your tree now um, and number four, you're exposing the uh, trunk. Did it get to number three? Yeah. 
<laughs> did a lot of editing. I, I had to think about it for a second. I'm like, yeah, we did. <laughs> Number four, you're exposing the trunk of the tree and your gymnosperms, which are your oldest tree species on the planet, the palms, conifers, um, are the old species. The, those trunks are, to treat, the reason the trees grow the way they do is to protect the trunks and to moderate the soil temperature below them so that they're not subject to what they call thermal damage to the, to the cambium. Um, when we raise them up like this and we clean them all out and make them all look pretty and stuff like that, that's what we're, we're subjecting them to. So we, we create four stresses out of one that is aesthetic. Okay, so we make it look pretty, but we're creating all these other 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 issues. And if they don't clean their tools, you may get cytospora. So you could be adding five stresses and you're paying for it. It's kind of like topping the tree. You're paying, you're paying somebody to do that. It doesn't take a lot of skills to top a tree. Um, you go up, you cut the top off. Um, so, you know, be mindful of when you're paying somebody to come in and prune, that they're going to be pruning to a certain set of standards. Um, and those standards are, are fairly straightforward, you know, no, no internodal cuts. That's a, a cut like on this branch, for example, just making a cut right there because, you know, people are walking underneath instead of going back to a node that has the auxins and chemicals in there to create those beautiful little callus woundwood coverings, like so, like so. Okay. If you do an internodal cut, there's, there's no callusing. There's no, there's no wound wood development because there's no chemicals there that, to, to produce that. Uh, so no internodal cuts, uh, no topping. And I'm not, I'm not saying never top because if you know, you get the hospital, for example, they got a new helicopter about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And uh, they had a bunch of pine trees out there before they built the parkade. And the helicopter was bigger and heavier. So those trees had to be shortened. Okay, so I had the option there of complete removal or just topping them. So we did top them. So there is a there is a reason sometimes to do that, or you might just have a, a disease at the top of the tree so you can take that top out. But typically as, as a practice or as a standard, that's not something that we do and that's not something we promote. Um, that's, that's, that's considered an internodal cut on, on the top of your tree. And in a lot of trees, maples, poplars, uh, deciduous in particular, you're gonna cause a lot of rot, which is gonna lead us to the habitat tree which you already filmed, but we'll go back around there anyway, and I'll give a little more, a little more chat about that. How good they are for our environment compared to, you know, like having big dead stuff up there is okay as long as it's not over top of your deck or your swim pool or your your kid's room. <laughs> hey, locust. <laughs> okay, we got a mature one over there too we can look at, so everybody can get an idea what a mature honey locust looks like.